Well, as you give this morning, I want to share the title of my, my message for today, because it's not in a, a series, and so it's kind of its own little entity, and it's called Don't Forget the Journey. How many of you so often, you, you're so focused on where you want to go that you easily can forget the whole process of getting there? A lot of times, you want to forget the journey because it was difficult or was rough, but when you look back and you say, that wasn't an easy time, that wasn't necessarily fun, but that journey that helped shape, that, that journey helped change who I was. But what I want to start with this morning is asking, because I think a lot of us feel like we've clearly communicated something to somebody before, and they just didn't get it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, for example, if I were to start asking random things from the announcements that I just gave you, how many could remember what, everything I just said? That's why I give you a bulletin, so make sure they go home with you. Uh, but also, that's why when I'm communicating things, I make sure that things are on Facebook, things are on the website, things are on the bulletin, things are set from the pulpit. Because I know sometimes, as easily as you communicate, sometimes it's easy to still miss things and miss details. I want to share a few examples from a book called Disorder in the Court. These are things that people have actually said in court, word for word, taken down, and court reporters have published into a book. The first one is this. What is, the date of, what is your date of birth? July 15th. What year? Every year. <laughs> How old is your son, the, the one living with you? 38 or 35. I can't remember which. How long has he lived with you? 45 years. <laughs> she has three children, right? Yes. How many were boys? None. Were there any girls? <laughs> Took you a couple of years. Let me hear it again. She had three children, right? Yes. How many were boys? None. Were there any girls? Common sense tells you three. Can you describe the individual? He was about medium height and had a beard. Was this a male or a female? <laughs> Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? No. Did you check for blood pressure? No. Did you check for breathing? No. So then is it possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy? No. How can you be so sure, Doctor? Because his brain was sitting on my desk in a jar. But could the patient have still been alive nevertheless? Yes, it is possible that he could have been alive and practicing law somewhere. <laughs> you see, we can easily laugh at those examples because they didn't happen to us. We weren't involved in the process of those. But if you were the one doing the communicating there, you would struggle and you would have issues because like, this is a clear question I'm asking. Or this is a clear answer that I'm given. I feel like I'm communicating myself clearly, but for some reason the message isn't getting through. And today I want to look at um, an example from the Bible. This is actually something that I preached on last September, one of the first messages that I did in Joshua. And here's the thing I want you to walk away with. Daily miscommunication can be frustrating. When you think that you've said something clearly to your spouse, to your kids, to a coworker, and they don't get it, it can be frustrating. But communication that's essential and vital can be life-altering. That sometimes when we miss the communication, it can change our destination, it can change the way that we end up doing life. So this morning we're going to jump into Joshua chapter 3, uh, verse 1, and we're going to read through chapter 4, verse 9. And if you remember with this message last year, I had... Each of you can get a rock, and then we piled up rocks, and we built an altar. This is going to be the other end of the story today. So early one morning, Joshua and all the Israelites started out from Shittim. They went down to the Jordan River. They camped there before they went across it. After three days, the officers went all through the camp. They gave orders to the people. They said, watch for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. The priests, who are Levites, will be carrying it. When you see it, you must move out from where you are and follow it. Then you will know which way to go. You have never gone this way before. But don't go near the ark. Stay about a thousand yards away from it. Joshua said to the people, Set yourselves apart to the Lord. Tomorrow he'll do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Go and get the ark of the covenant. Walk on ahead of the people. So they went and got it. Then they walked on ahead of them. 
And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to honor you in the eyes of all the Israelites. Then they will know that I am with you, just as I was with Moses. Speak to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. Tell them, when you reach the edge of the Jordan River, go into the water and stand there. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here, listen to what the Lord your God is saying. You will soon know that the living God is among you. He will certainly drive out the people now living in the land. He'll do it to make room for you. He'll drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. The ark will go into the Jordan River ahead of you. It's the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the whole earth. Choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel. Choose one from each tribe. The priest will carry the ark of the Lord. He's the Lord of the whole earth. As soon as the priest step into the Jordan, it will stop flowing. The water that's coming down the river will pile up in one place. That's how you will know that the living God is among you. So the people took their tents down. They prepared to go across the Jordan River. The priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. The water of the Jordan was going over its banks. It always does that at the time the crops are being gathered. The priest came to the river. Their feet touched the water's edge. Right away, the water coming down the river stopped flowing. It piled up far away at a town called Adam near Zarethan. The water flowing down to the Dead Sea was completely cut off, so the people went across the Jordan River opposite Jericho. The priests carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. They stopped in the middle of the river and stood on dry ground. They stayed there until the whole nation of Israel had gone across on dry ground. After the whole nation had gone across the Jordan River, the Lord spoke to Joshua. He said, Choose twelve men from among the people. Choose one from each tribe. Tell them to get twelve stones from the middle of the river. They must pick them up from, the, from right where the priest stood. They must carry the stones over with all of you, and they must put them down at the place where you can stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from among the Israelites. There was one man from each tribe. He said to them, Go back to the middle of the Jordan River. Go to where the ark of the Lord your God is. Each one of you must pick up a stone. You must carry it on your shoulder. There will be as many stones as there are tribes in Israel. The stones will serve as a reminder to you. In days to come, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the Lord cut off the flow of water in the Jordan River. Tell them its water stopped flowing when the ark of the covenant of the Lord went across. The stones will always remind the Israelites of what happened there. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River. There was one stone for each of the tribes of Israel. It was just as the Lord had told Joshua. The people carried the stones with them to their camp. There they put them down. Joshua also piled up 12 stones in the middle of the river. He piled them up right where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are still there to this very day. As we look through that passage of scripture, there's a lot of things that I think God wanted Israel to learn from this particular miracle. The first was this, is that God wanted the Israelites to know that he was going to be with Joshua the same way that he had been with Moses. Whenever you go through a leadership change or a, uh, some kind of spiritual change, whether it's a workplace you've been in, whether it's been a church that you've attended, even if it's a government uh, change, that when you go through a change in leadership from someone that you really like to somebody different and you feel unsure and you don't really know what's going to happen, you don't really know, is this going to be a good change, is this going to be a bad change, you want that settled feeling of everything is going to be okay, everything is going to keep going, everything is going to be healthy and it's going to grow. If you look at Moses, who the Israelites had saw, had experienced God, that Moses had so many encounters with God that were unique, that even when you think of going all the way back to Egypt, that he would have his staff and he could throw his staff down and it would turn into a snake, that he could reach into his uh, cloak and pull his hand back out and uh, leprosy and then put it back in, that they saw the ten plagues, they saw leaving Egypt, they saw all of this incredible things, that they were at the foot of the mountain when Moses was meeting with God, and now we have Joshua. And what comes now? This is different, this isn't what we've experienced before. I'm not really sure, but God, right off the bat, I think it's amazing the fact that what's the very first thing he does is he approaches in the very same manner with Moses, that when the Egyptians were chasing Moses and Moses uh, holds up his staff and they go through the, the river. Then in the same kind of moment, you have Joshua leading the people across. And God does it differently. This time it's the ark going into uh, the water first, that God is going before their difficult struggle, but he's proving the fact that just like I was with Moses, I'm here with Joshua too. 
The second thing is this, is that most of the year, the Jordan River was about 100 feet wide and only 3 to 10 feet deep. Not that big of a deal to cross. You kind of think that it's like 100 feet wide. That's, that's really not too far, 30 yards or so. Not that big of a deal, 3 feet. I think most of us in this room that I'm aware of are taller than 3 feet. And it could go up to 10, but I think most of us, if we have the ability to swim, that it may be difficult, but we could swim across a 100-foot wide river if we had to that was at most 10 feet deep in places. But that's not what they encountered that day. If you remember from the passage, it said that it was at flood stage because of this time of the year it was, and that the banks were overflowing. They approached the Jordan at a time where it would be most difficult to cross, that they wouldn't be able to because it was overflowing, that a miracle needed to be, that needed to be taking place. And here's the thing I want you to realize, is most of us want a miracle to happen. But in order for a miracle to happen, there has to be a need for that miracle. That we don't like the fact of, well, God, I need to be in a difficult, hard place. But that's where miracles come from. Because if we need a miracle, we need to be able to have to turn to God and say, God, I need you to come through. I cannot do this on my own. I need a miracle. I need God to intervene. And usually we make these kind of prayers when we're in a desperate time. We make these kind of prayers where somebody is sick. We make these kind of prayers when financial situations are a problem. We, we make this when there's issues in a marriage. We, God, we need you to come through. But I think the more miracles we see, the more we realize that God can come through, the quicker we say, I don't want to try to do this on my own. Because if I try to do this on my own, I'm not going to be successful. But if I turn and say, God, have your way in everything, the more miracles we experience, the more we start realizing that God's in control and we turn things over in our life to God even quicker. The third thing is this. The Ark of the Covenant was God's throne on earth. It's his resting place. So the Lord went into the dangerous river first, dem demonstrating his role as Israel's protector. God is your protector. He goes before you. He will enter into something that's difficult before you. And a lot of times, we don't necessarily see God going before us, but God is going before us. You think back to the passage, the Israelites were commanded to stay what would be the equivalent today of a thousand yards away. When we think of a football field, that's a hundred yards. This is staying ten football fields away from the Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant. Ten football fields away from the direct presence of God. There is people who were unable to see the Ark of the Covenant as they're passing through. They know that God is there. They're not able to see what God is doing, but they have to trust that God is doing it. And then there's people who were closer, and they may have been on that, that far edge where they could see the Ark. They may be able to see what God's doing. But here's the thing is, when we know that God is going before us, when we know that God has got our backs, that God is taking care of us, and we trust God, we don't have to see that God's doing something to know that he's doing something. So often we have this attitude of, God, I want to see you do this. And sometimes we just don't get to see it because we can't see far enough away to what is God working and how is he kind of interworking all these different things, all these little different stories. But I think most of us, if we look through the course of, of our life, we would see how this situation 10 years ago and this situation three years ago prepared you for something that you're going to face next month. And you don't really understand, why did this happen 10 years ago? And you never get an answer, but then all of a sudden you see that God's preparing you for a month from now with something that happened 10 years ago. The thing that happens so often is I think that we, as Christians, it's easy for us to put on like a face of like, I'm, gonna, I'm following after God, everything is good, everything is, is great, and I just love Jesus. I, I saw a, a quick clip from a, a preacher a couple days ago named John Gray, and it, it struck me. It was probably one of the most impactful points I've ever heard in about a minute of preaching. And he was talking about spiritual PDA, and that's not, for those of you in the 90s, that's not a personal digital assistant, that's public display of affection. And how many of you are you're aware of that term? You've heard it before. It basically, it's that idea when you're, you're walking around, like if you were to walk into the mall today and you would see, uh, like especially, it gets thrown out around teenagers quite a bit. Like they're holding hands, they're all on top of each other, they're kissing, and it's like, like, I don't need to see that. Like, 
and to stop doing it. It's like that's awkward, that's uncomfortable. And the thing that I think you realize that as you move into getting married and you start going through it's the love doesn't stop, the love changes. And there's not necessarily always this need of like, let me make everybody feel uncomfortable with how much I care for my spouse. Because you can go from PDA in that moment into intimacy with your spouse. It changes. The need to do this in a public setting goes away because you can still, like there's a different level of the relationship. And I think a lot of times what happens to Christians is we get stuck in a spiritual PDA type of moment. Of, I can come to church, I can raise my hands, I can sing loud, I can do all the right things, I, I've got enough of scripture memorized that I can impress people, but there's no depth to the relationship whatsoever. We have even those church like lingo that, that you know, in 2019, God, he's going to birth something new in my life. He's going to do something great in my life, and this is great. But in order for God to birth and to do something new and unique and different, we have to move from having spiritual PDA to spiritual intimacy with God. You see, when you think of someone who is with child, that ultimately they start showing it naturally over time. Why? Because there was a moment of conception, there was a moment that changed things, and something is being prepared to be given birth. There's a lot of Christians out there that I think they're not showing anything, but they're talking about it. They're talking about what God's going to do, but they're not showing anything simply because they haven't spent an intimate time with God yet. And if we don't need to, when we're really spending time with God, we're really growing with God, we don't have to tell everybody about what's going on because everybody can naturally just see it all over us. Is that, wow, that person's with God because it's changing everything about who they are. It's changing the way they talk. It's changing the words they use. It's changing their attitudes that things are falling apart but you're still seeing a smile on their face because they know that God's in control. When we look at this, some of the Israelites got to see the ark going across and some didn't, but ultimately they all crossed over because God was doing something. You may not always be able to see the details behind what's going on, but when we have real spiritual intimacy with God, we know that God's in control, and I don't need to know all the details. I just know that God's going to take me from one side of the river to the other, and he's going to go before me and take care of me. And then finally, the crossing into the promised land represented a break with Israel's past. They've been wandering around in the desert for 40 years. That God had been meeting all their needs, that their clothes weren't wearing out, that he had provided manna. And we're going to find out a couple chapters later that the manna is about to go away. Now, I want you to imagine something that has been a part of your spiritual life for a significant amount of time. If you've been a Christian for 10 years, then 10 years. If you've been a Christian for 60 years, 60 years. That this has always been a part. And imagine if all of a sudden God said, that needs to go away. This needs to change. It'd be uncomfortable. Because you say, well, I don't want to give that up. God, you've been providing this for me for a while. But God's saying, There's, it's a new season. It's time for something different. Because in order to go where the Israelites needed to go, God needed to remove something that the Israelites liked. If God would have allowed them to keep having manna, they would have missed out on the milk and honey of the new land. And the only way to get them to go where they needed to go was to take away something that they enjoyed so that God could give them something even better. But so often, we struggle with that concept. We've got, I don't want to give this up. And God's looking at you like, I've got something better. Lydia's got these two uh, unicorn stuffed animals. She's big into unicorns right now. And one of them can like, fit in, my, in the palm of my hand, and the other one, like, I would have to use two hands if I was holding it there right now. And there's moments where she just wants the small unicorn. And I'm thinking, well, why do you want the small one? Here's the big one. They're identical unicorns. But she wants the smaller one for whatever reason. And I think sometimes it's kind of that imagery with God is that we have this small thing where we're like, God, I'm okay holding on to this. I know there's something better out over there, but I'm very comfortable with this. And so sometimes God has to allow situations to come that will remove what we're comfortable with so that we can move into what God wants us. Because sooner or later, we'll get more comfortable with that bigger unicorn. I want you to all imagine like you're walking out of here with a big unicorn today. But God always has something next and something next. And every time that God wants to 
bless you with more and so that you can bless others with more. But if you want to hold on to what God's done in, in the past and only hold on to that, then we're not able to move into what's next. So God's teaching the Israelites all these different lessons, and they're commanded by Joshua to go and teach the next generation to do this. And you think of that, that's the reason why they built those monuments. That's the reason why there's the monuments that, uh, that he, he set up in the river. That's why they built the monument where each one, uh, each man from each tribe grabbed a stone that was big enough that they had to carry on their shoulders so they could build a big monument so that they could go back and they could point to it and say, this is what God did here. This is where God changed things. This moment in history changed things. How many of you in here, you're big fans of, of history. When you're in school, like history was your subject. It was, it was completely my favorite subject. That to me, I was, a, I was pretty good at math. I could do science. English wasn't my favorite to, to study, but history, I love studying history. I took a couple extra history classes in college simply because it's interesting to me, especially when you have a good history teacher. A good history teacher changes the equation. It's, I've had some teachers that they're boring and it's like, okay, you're just reading out of the textbook to me. But then I had some history teachers who would make it come to life and really would make it interesting. And those are the teachers that would help me understand this is what happened in our country and this is why it happened and this is how we can prevent some of those things from happening again. And so that's what Joshua is attempting to do here. He's attempting to say, you need to tell your children about this so that your children will tell your uh, grandchildren and they will tell their great-grandchildren and continue it on so that this story never gets lost. This matters. Tell the story of what God is doing. But what happens? Looking at Judges chapter 2, 6 through 11, this gives us the answer. Joshua sent the Israelites away. Then they went to take over the land. All of them went to their own shares of land. The people served the Lord as long as Joshua lived. They also served him as long as the elders lived. Those were the elders who lived longer than Joshua did. They had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, the servant of the Lord, died. He was the son of Nun. He was 110 years old when he died. His people buried him on his own property at Timnath Paris. It's north of Mount Gash in the hill country of Ephraim. All the people of Joshua's time joined the members of their families who had already died. Then those who were born after them grew up. They didn't know the Lord and what he had done for Israel. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They served gods that were named Baal. One generation. One generation changes. And everything's lost. That's why doing youth ministry matters. That's why doing children's ministry matters. That's why all of us as a church have to do our part in consistently telling of what God has done. Because if we don't tell with what God has done in our own lives, then eventually that message will get lost. It's like playing a game of telephone. We, we could take the time right now and we could play a game of telephone and I could start on one side of the room and start off with the, the purple elephant likes eating circus peanuts. And by the time it gets to the other side of the room, it's going to sound something completely different from that because as it gets passed from person to person to person, they're not going to hear it properly unless it is clearly communicated again and again and again and again so that nobody forgets it. That there is the monument that we come back here. Why do we celebrate this monument? Because this is what God did for us here. This is what God did for our family here. This is what God did for our family here. Because so often it's easy to look at what's going on in our country today. What's, what are our struggles as, as people in this world today? And we say, well, that generation, they just they don't have it together. And I would challenge that by saying, as a church, we haven't done a good enough job of communicating what God did, why he did it, and that ought to encourage us to say it's time that we stop shifting the blame to other people for their sins and start saying we as the church need to rise up and do a better job of clearly communicating the power of Jesus Christ, what he has done, that he came down, that he was uh, born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he was a phenomenal teacher, that he changed things, he turned things upside down, he sent out disciples, he was uh, put to death when he didn't deserve it, that he was resurrected, that he 
went back up into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper, and he encouraged us and challenged us and gave it our mandate that we need to go into all the world and tell all people about who he is so that all can be saved. That's our call. And so often we get lost in all the details of life. I don't care if you're the most or the least successful person at your job. The mission that matters most is telling who Jesus Christ is. Now, as we tell people who Jesus Christ is, we need to be the best representation of Jesus in the space that we are given. That means being the best mother, being the best father, being the best brother, being the best sister, being the, the best worker, co-worker, employee, employer, whatever God has put you in, wherever he has placed you, it is your responsibility to do the best that you can with the power of the Holy Spirit helping you to be the person that will change the atmosphere where God has placed you. We sang earlier that when, when he walks into the room, everything changes. How does he walk into the room today? When you walk into the room and you take the presence of God with you. That's how things change. When you walk into the room, everything should change because you should be bringing the Holy Spirit in with you into every single room. That when you leave this place today and you go into a restaurant, you're bringing Jesus into that restaurant. When you go into your workplace tomorrow, you're bringing Jesus into the workplace. When you go into your doctor's appointment, you're bringing Jesus into the doctor's appointment. Wherever you go, you're bringing Jesus. When Jesus enters, things change. If things aren't changing, then you're not bringing Jesus in with you. And you need to go back and say, okay, it's not about spiritual uh, public displays of affection to Jesus. I need spiritual intimacy with Jesus so that when I go into places, things change. And they're drastically changed. Here's the thing I want to encourage you about. I believe there is great power in things like apologetics, of knowing what you believe, why you believe it, the science behind it. I believe that the Bible can be backed up with the science. I don't think that there are these two separate entities that disagree. I think sometimes when we look at science simply from, well, let's eliminate God and then try and explain things. That's why a lot of times science doesn't work, is because if I'm trying to figure out how does this work? But I'm going to remove the right answer, and then I'm going to try and figure out how it works. That doesn't, that's not how science works. You're supposed to be able to look at everything as, a, as equal opportunity. And here's the thing with apologetics, that there's always going to be somebody who has an angle that they're a little bit smarter than you at. They may have more answers on one side of this or that. You can debate facts. Those of you in the room that you have something that you care about, that you're passionate about, that you have, whether it's a favorite sports team, whether it's a favorite movie, you can get into arguments about why this book is better than that book. And the thing is, when you're arguing about things of that nature, you're arguing facts, and you can make up facts. For example, 37% of statistics are made up on the spot. A couple of you got that. Because next time I tell you, it'll be 47% of statistics are made up on the spot. A lot of times people have knowledge, but we're trusting that they are correct with all the knowledge. Here's the one thing that cannot be debated. Your personal testimony. Because I can tell you, well, I disagree with you on that. I've seen this and this. When I come and I tell you, this is what God has done in my life. This is where I was. I was stuck in this. And God came along and he saved me, he changed my life, he set me free, and now I'm this person. You can't argue that. You cannot argue that with somebody. Your testimony matters so much. Your witness, that's why when we look at somebody uh, at a trial, when you get called to the witness stand, they're calling you for a particular reason. Now, if I witnessed the crime this afternoon, and I got called in, and that I had to sit in the witness stand, they're not calling me in to do forensics. Why? Because I haven't studied forensics. That's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is I witnessed the crime. I saw what happened. I was an eyewitness. Let me share what happened. Now they're going to bring in somebody else who is going to look at the crime scene and look at the forensics and say, I wasn't there, but based off of all my education, all of my knowledge, and is studying the crime scene, this is what I believe happened with my 37 years of expertise. They're going to call that person to do the forensics, and I think here's the problem. So often, we eliminate our testimony from being valid because it's not the same testimony as that person. 
and we eliminate ourselves from having an impact in someone else's life because my testimony is not as good as theirs. No, your testimony is different. Your testimony matters. Your witness matters. Otherwise, you wouldn't be called to the stand. And in this life that we're living, where we're all called to make an impact for Christ, each and every one of us has a particular area of expertise because it's something that has happened in our life, something that we've went through, something that God has pulled us through. And when we share our expertise, we share our witness, we share our testimony, things change because Jesus is with us as we share that testimony. When we lead our conversations with our faults and failures, we allow the ability for someone to call us a hypocrite to go out the window. When I start with saying, hey, this is who I was, everything changes. The ability to be embarrassed about your past goes out the window because you're the one who put your past out there. Now if somebody comes up and tries to throw something in your face, it's like, yeah, I've heard you freely admit that. That's who I was before Christ. But look who I am now. Look how God has changed me. Look what God's equipping me to do. Things are different. We do it again and again and again. And we don't forget that this is the monument that God called us to build. This is where he changed things. This is where he changed the equation completely. And we go back to this and we point it out. And we point it out and we keep telling that story even until we feel like we're blue in the face because the next generation needs to hear it clearly so that they can go to where they need to go. Because what is tolerated in one generation will be permissible in the next. When we tolerate sin and say, well, it's not that big of a deal, the next generation will look at it and say, you said it wasn't that bad, so let me go ahead and try it. Let me see if it's okay. And it just continues to snowball and to snowball. What's allowed in one generation will become normal in the next generation. So what we should be saying is, this is who God is. This is how we're going to raise you. This is what we believe in. As a church, it's all of us. I don't care if you, you don't have any children here. I don't care if you don't have any grandchildren here. It is on all of us to be representatives of Christ for every single teenager that ever walks in this building, for every single kid who ever walks into this building, for every little, little uh, child in the nursery today. They're going to grow up watching you live your Christian life. And they're going to make their fundamental decision of, are they going to follow God? after watching everybody in the place that they call a church. We need to point to this next generation and say, this is what God has done here. And God's not done with us yet. God's something, God's something greater to store for us. Now, there's something else that we're called in Scripture to do again and again until God comes back, and that's communion. Luke chapter 22, uh, verses 14 through 20 say this. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles took their places at the table he said to them, I have really looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you. I wanted to do this before I suffered. I tell you, I will not eat the Passover meal again until it is celebrated in God's kingdom. After Jesus took the cup, he gave thanks. He said, take this cup and share it among yourselves. I tell you, I will not drink wine with you again until God's kingdom comes. Then Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it. He handed it to them and said, this is my body. It is given for you. Every time you eat it, do this in memory of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is poured out for you. If the worship team would go ahead and come on up. We're going to do communion different today. We're not doing it here. If you've been around long enough with me, you realize that I like doing communion different. Because I don't like communion becoming something that is done the exact same way every single time where it just becomes, oh, we're just, we're doing communion again. That's just that part of the service. So today, communion is going to be on you. At the, the end of our uh, song that we're going to end with, I've got a prepackaged cup of grape juice and a piece of bread that you're going to take. And I want you to take one for everyone that's in your family. And if you've got somebody who's not here today, make sure to take one home for them. If you've got someone who maybe you've been witnessing to and you've been sharing your faith with and you need to do this as well or take an extra one for you and take one for them even. What I want you to do today with this communion is you're going to lead your own family in communion at home. It's as easy as this as when we look at this passage in Luke chapter 22. There's other passages in each of the Gospels that shares what communion is. It's simply this is going through and just remembering this is what God did for us. 
this symbol is what God did for us. It's nothing special on my behalf as a pastor of, of leading. It's something that you can lead both yourself into and your family into. And here's the, the, the job I want you to do when you partake in communion. I want you to tell your family story again. Whether this is at lunchtime, whether this is at dinner, whether this is today or it's tomorrow or next Saturday, I want you to sit down and share, this is what God has done in our family. This is what our family's story is. This is where God has brought our family. This is what he brought us through. We started here, we were struggling here, and God came and picked us up and moved us from this place to the next because we need to not forget the journey. If we only put our focus on the destination, we lose sight for everybody else because, oh, I know where I'm going. That's great that you know where you're going. You may know where they're going. And when you stop and you share your story with the people that God has placed in your life, it changes things. It's that reminder to you of, I don't have it all together because this is where I started. And it was God who saved me. I needed some miracles along the way. I needed some forgiveness along the way. And it helps remind you that you need to be given that same, that same witness to people who come uh, up in your life that need Jesus. That you need to be praying for them. That God will give them the very miracle that they need. Because our prayers are powerful. Our prayers change things. That when we come alongside, things change. That the river can stop. That the people can walk through on dry land. And it's by the prayers of God's people that things change. We need to be willing to offer forgiveness because this communion represents the forgiveness that God offered to us in the first place. When we realize the fact that, yes, I was a sinner, yes, I feel confident where I'm going. I ask for forgiveness. We need to realize that there's people who haven't heard the story. And if they haven't heard the story, then they don't know where they're going. And if they don't know where they're going, they need somebody to point out, here's my story. Here's what God did in my life. So that they can be encouraged and say, you know what? That's where God built, uh, built that monument in your life. I want him to build it right here in mine. So that this day I would change, change my ways. Communion is a simple thing, but it has a powerful effect to remember what God has done in each and every one of our lives. Today we're going to end with one song of worship. And as we sing, I just want you to put the focus on what has God done in your life? What is it that you need to share? Is it something that you've just always known that you needed to share this and you just kind of held on to this personal testimony, but you know somebody needs to hear it? It's time to share it. If you need to grab, there is 250 of these cups. I know we have enough. If you need to grab some extra cups so that you can have communion directly with somebody else and you can share, this is the story, you can witness to them, and then you can partake together and start that monument for them, realizing, like, I know you think you know who Jesus is. Let's make sure you really do. Let's make sure that you move from just being able to publicly display it to actually a spiritual intimacy where you know who God is. You know what he's doing in your life, and you know that he wants to do it in others, and that we need to move to that next level. This morning as we end, it's going to be with the song, We'll Praise the Name. It's a name that's worthy to be praised. It's Jesus Christ. So if you would just stand with me, we're going to just partake in a little bit of worship. I'll pray, and then you'll be free to come up and take the, the communion cups for your family.